Welcome to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. This is the second part of our full interview with Kurt Smith, where we discuss treasury from a cost center to a profit center perspective. Kurt is the director of Marengo Capital and vice president and technical director of ACTA, the Australian Corporate Treasury Association. Kurt has a diverse professional background, including banking as a head of derivative trading, fund management as an investment strategist, consultant with Marengo Capital, and of course, corporate treasurer. Marengo Capital is a corporate advisory company which specializes in creating and managing value. Kurt's sweet spot is in strategic treasury and corporate finance, ensuring that capital is sourced, structured, and allocated in a value-creating way. In the episode of today, expect to learn how treasury departments could actually become profit centers, what metrics such as ROIC, return on invested capital, triple C, cash conversion cycle, WAC, weighted average cost of capital mean, and how treasury could influence all those. And of course, much, much more. We really hope you will enjoy the episode as much as we did recording it with Kurt. And when you think about how you discovered the podcast, it was probably through word of mouth, social media, or a recommendation from a friend or your favorite podcast app. And this is our ask to you. The only way people can discover our podcast and learn more about corporate treasury is thanks to you. So if you could follow the show, give us a review, or share the episode if you like it, it would truly mean the world to us. Last but not least, if you are interested in artificial intelligence and how it can transform our corporate treasury industry, join our bi-weekly newsletter, AI Treasury Insight. Follow the link in the description or head to corporate-treasury-101.com slash newsletter. With all that being said, please welcome Kurt Smith. Kurt, I'd like to come back on something you said earlier in the introduction, um, how to take treasury from a cost center, which is in most cases true, and transform it into a profit center. Well, that starts by actually making up for the cost that you incur. How do you do that? How do you make that happen? So I think, first off, people need to understand how value is created. So value is created by increasing cash. Um, and by reducing the cost of capital. And, and both of those things is, is right where treasury plays. We follow cash through the whole business um, and we do that in order to, to forecast cash and to make sure that liquidity is available to, to pay bills, make sure funding's available for, for capital expenditure programs. But we, we follow this, this arterial flow of cash through the business and, it, and it's as a result of that, what what I suggest and, and the way I look at it is here's the spectrum of activity that's you know under a cash heading. You can do just you can just forecast it in order to ensure that there's liquidity available. The other thing that you can do is you can actually turn your mind to how do I increase it? Because if you're increasing it, you're then adding value. And there, there's there's a lot of simple things that can be done and really simple things. Uh, one thing that I did, I, I was talking to our CFO and I was saying, there's a lot of money that's wasted in the business. And he challenged me and said, well, I don't, no, I don't think so. I think we're, we're lean, lean. Um, I don't think that's the case. And, and we sort of, we parted agreeing to disagree. So I, I put a meeting in his calendar, um, for half an hour about two weeks after that and then i just went down and said come with me and we just walked around the business and i said and we had 10 floors and and on the 10 floors of the business there were two printing pods in on each floor and they were stacked floor to ceiling with reams of paper and i just well you know there's your working capital sitting right there doing nothing um we went to other floors that were not fully populated and this is before this is before COVID, where there's a greater expectation now that they're not going to be fully populated. But you know, I said, look, you've got rent going out the door on these floors, but why we're not using them? 
and and just little things like that. Uh, and, and and really, it's about everybody in the business. So not just treasury, but everybody in the business knowing what value drivers are. And and people have heard cash is king all the time, but what it means is that an operational person that might be out, um, you know, um, drilling holes in the ground looking for gold needs to understand that everything that they do is about, well, not even, a lot of what they do is about increasing cash in the business. And it's either finding the product in the ground, but it's also, um, you know, what vehicles are you looking to purchase to to support that? How are you, how are you looking to go about it? How are you going to do your, your, your maintenance in an efficient way to, to, to save money? Because those things, that's what's going to generate um, value and generating value is what makes the company economically sustainable. And it's funny, as, as financial people, we understand what, what value means. Operational people don't always. Um, I can remember talking to one that, and I was talking about value, just assuming that they knew what it meant. And and they sort of, they were an engineer, um, and they sort of said to me, oh, you just want to sell the company. No, I, I don't. What I want to do is all the things you want to build, I want to be able to fund. And, and I can only fund that if the capital base is growing. And for that, that means that the capital we deploy, we need to recover it through a return. And and if if we're doing that, then we can do more. If we can't do that, we'll do less over time. So it's things that you you take for granted that um, it, yeah, it, it can be perceived by by other people. And I think over time, I started off talking mainly with CFOs and then I've realized as as time has gone on especially as a consultant but as a treasurer of formalin I, I spend a, a lot of time talking to COOs actually understanding the business understanding what it does how it does it where the pain points are and a lot of this is it, it has to be done before you want anything from somebody if we're talking, you know, we were talking about KPIs, one of the KPIs I had on of my team members was you've got to meet with people uh, in the business. So you need to phone people up or email them, ask them for a coffee, whatever it is, in order to sit down and understand the business really well. Super interesting, Kurt. I mean, it's something that, I mean, speaking to a lot of treasurers, it's a lot, something we definitely think touch on little less. It is indeed a lot more operational. Um, and risk management as opposed to value creation, which is just interesting shift of mindset. You, you mentioned their um, return on invested capital, right? That's a that's a KPI that gets thrown around quite a lot. Could you just help us like define that maybe mathematically? Like, what is the equation for return on invested capital, and how can treasury departments specifically optimize that? Like, what's the practical examples or steps to optimize your return on invested capital that you could suggest? Return on invested capital, it does have some minor differences in terms of how things are defined, depending on, on whether companies in, in multiple tax jurisdictions, whether they're active in M&A and things like that. But if we look at it more simply, it's effectively net operating profit after tax divided by invested capital. So what that is, is uh, earnings before interest and then applying a notional tax to that, not actual tax, but notional tax, and then divided by the sum of operating working capital and net property plan. So in the end, what does that mean? It, it's, it's, it's operating returns that are unaffected by, by leverage and, and tax structures. And, and I, I sort of mentioned before that I think we could say that pretty much every treasury sources capital, whether it's from from internally, whether it's um, bank capital, whether it's uh, debt capital markets, some structure capital, so influence, you know, how much is into debt, how much is into equity, but very few allocate capital. And so thinking about return on invested capital doesn't cover come across a lot of treasury teams' minds. It's not it's certainly not front of mind. And that's that's what's key for capital allocation. 
And as I've said, you, you've got to increase, you, you've basically got to have a return on invested capital that exceeds the weighted average cost of capital for value to grow. And if you're taking, you should have a return that's commensurate with the risk that you're taking to be allocatively efficient, right? So, so both of those things go hand in hand. How do you apply that? Well, it, it can actually get pretty difficult because on the return on invested capital front, most of that's about optimizing your, your operating working capital. So they're your internal funding sources and it's about increasing cash. That's what covers your, your return on invested capital. If we're looking at your cost of capital, then that's that's all those things that you that you need to do. Um, like if you've got a credit rating agency, you, then uh, where you're being rated, you, you want to be looking at reducing your earnings volatility so that you can potentially get a step change in your rating by by improving your earnings volatility. Um, you need to be very mindful of your banking covenants and and your your credit rating down triggers. What's the most binding constraints there, and and be looking to to manage to to those outcomes, so that you you don't have a, a step change going the other way, right? A, a downgrade event or or a um, going from a stable to to a, a watch um, environment, and then when you're looking at earnings volatility, that's your financial risk management coming in. So it, so it's going from a transactional risk management, I'm raising 500 million in USPP markets, so I'm going to do this hedge to hedge away the the US dollar exposure, I'm going to do this hedge to, to hedge away the interest rate exposure. It's going from that environment to panning back more and saying, well, okay, what's what's really important is that we manage to our credit rating in order to ensure that we're, we're, we're going to be managing our interest exposure there first, then looking at how much do we want to have uh, between fixed and floating and everything else. So I think it's that it's that ad- additional step is, is what turns it from being a, a more operational or transactional focus into more of a strategic focus. Kurt Woods. Would a treasurer that is, say, identifying a region that is borrowing cash, a few hundred millions, for instance, while seeing an other region that is actually cash rich and not really doing much with that money and putting a centralization in place, be a good example of how treasury can actually influence that metric, the return on invested capital? Because by repaying internal debt and ident- identifying those opportunities, that that's actually putting the finger on the ROIC, right? Or is my understanding not correct here? No, it's spot on. Absolutely. So it comes down to a lot of those in- intercompany funding the regimes, and um, yeah, it's it's a it's a clear opportunity. I'm working with an entity at the moment that has a lot of sub entities, uh, and they said. Um, they basically didn't have a good feel for how much cash they, they had on hand and what they should do about it. And the cash that they've got is $2.2 billion, um, which, you know, that's a substantial amount of money uh, to not be fully aware of how much they've got. And so the, the traditional treatment by Treasury is a very good one. And, and that is to say, well, okay, can we centralise the management of this in somebody who has the skills to do it, where you can actually shift money between jurisdictions, between entities, so that you're always netting, you're always internally funding whatever you can, so that you only go externally from one source. And then what that allows you to do is reduce the frequency with which you have to go externally in in the first instance, but then it also allows you to go in a wholesale way with a lot more clout rather than finding somebody that's an entity that's short of cash is, is borrowing frequently at high rates 
an entity that's surplus in cash is investing at, at lower rates. You, you're on both sides of the market and getting hurt both times. So yeah, no, you're, you're actually spot on. Good. Can you take us deeper into the cash flow side of what you said earlier? So you said that treasurers can be more strategic and optimize their return on invested capital by well, one leaner of that, one lever of that is maximizing cash, right? Which is typically like one of the traditional, let's say, operational roles that we would expect out of a treasury department, um, as you broke it down earlier. How do you look at cash management and cash flow forecasting um, in more of a strategic treasurer manner? And how, how can a strategic treasurer bring to the table ways to optimize that? Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I guess for me, firstly, it's about increasing cash flow. So that that's the, that's the first thing. So rather than just forecasting it, actually increasing it. But but it's probably to go into even broadening up the, the spectrum somewhat um, by by looking across working capital. So your operating uh, working capital uh, includes your your cash balances, and and so one is your your cash balance. What's actually sitting there? You want to you want to be effectively uh, optimizing your, your operating working capital and that comes through the, the cash conversion cycle and and that's where you've got essentially your day's sales outstanding, um, your day's inventory outstanding minus your day's payable outstanding and so you, you want to be optimizing that because that's a relatively cheap form of internal funding. Now in in more recent times after after COVID, it became less of a mathematical issue and and did bring in some need uh, for for nuance. So uh, pre-COVID, we'd be just saying, okay, we'll drag your payables out as long as possible without really annoying people. And and that was really that equation um, for, for optimizing cash conversion cycle. Since COVID, you also have to be strategic enough to think, okay, we, we've got to support our supply chain, and there's uh, it may be that there's this particularly um, a key supplier that we just need to pay promptly, um, even pay early in order to guarantee uh, our, our our supplies. So it's become a little bit more nuanced then, but I think there's with cash, you've you've sort of got two things: you've got the balance. And, and, and the balance is always a tension between you don't want to be having a lazy balance sheet, so you don't want to have too much cash on hand, but you do want to be able to also show the market that you've got access to liquidity. So you, you, want, to, you want to balance off that sort of internal tension. And then there's the cash flows. And the cash flows are about, for me anyway, it's about going beyond forecasting them and then stepping into how to increase them. And, and increasing them, you know, I gave simple examples of sort of walking the CFO around the business and pointing to, to, to things that you can do. But I, I think a lot of it comes down to speaking with the operational side of the business and really understanding what they do and how they do it and where their pain points are. And sometimes uh, what you can do can really add a lot of value. I, I worked with a regulated utility as a regulated utility, they had um, a, a, a revenue base that was set by the regulator. There was a particular nuance to that um, where the, the cash flows were, were very sawtoothed in, in the way that they, they came through. That was causing a bit of a problem with the business. And so we worked the, uh, with the economic regulator, the policy arm, to look at modifying how the cash was, was calculated in order to make it smoother. And they were quite happy to do that because it meant that the tariffs were smoother for consumers as well. But what it did for us and the reason why we really wanted to do it is it brought forward a billion dollars worth of cash. Um, now, it didn't increase cash per se in terms of the nominal amount, but it brought it forward. So in discounted terms, it increased the discounted cash, and so that's increasing value. So it's it's things like that. It's it's thinking with a commercial hat on 
all the time. What can we do? Nobody had ever really negotiated with the regulator because everybody assumes that the regulator wouldn't do it. But there are opportunities. You've sometimes just got to think a little bit outside the box and then you've got to continue to pursue it when people say it can't be done. Everybody tells you it can't be done. For some reason, it can't be done. And it may be the case. You may sort of, you know, after five, six, seven meetings, say, yeah, okay, it can't be done. But often people would just say it can't be done because they don't want to do it or because it, it involves a, a bit of work to pursue. But if there's an opportunity, like, like a billion dollars, that's an easy one. That, that's a lot of money, so you're going to pursue that, right? But even when I've spoken to people about other things, optimizing cash, so not having not having too much cash on hand, paying down, paying down debt, managing your liquidity tightly. And and I had somebody with a client turn around and say, well, that, that's only a hundred grand. It'll only save a hundred grand. You know, if we keep it, it's not going to matter. It, it'll make it administratively easier is how it was described to me. And I said, we can never have administrative ease drive economic outcomes. And if we can't optimize cash, then what that says to me uh, we've got a real problem as Treasury because that's a core part of our business. And if we're not going to do that, we can look at at contracting out the Treasury function because we just that's that's not good enough. And if it, it, it's quite simple, it comes down to it. I think if if you wouldn't do it with your own money, then you shouldn't do it with somebody else's. A, a hundred grand means enough to me personally. That I wouldn't expect the company to just absorb a hundred grand when it's a pretty simple thing to just look and say, well, okay, we'll we'll pay down this debt on Wednesday and we'll re- re-borrow again on Friday. It's not a difficult thing to do, um, but all of those things add up into creating substantial. Pain. I like that. So I like that you a few things from what you said there, Kurt. So you give a couple practical tips, right? So you said. Hey, look, go and speak to operations. That's that's or look at the operations of the company itself and and go through their pain points and how they believe where they believe opportunities lie because they're the ones in it day in day out. So that that's super interesting. Uh, and the other one you said, uh, which is kind of interesting, is indeed don't don't be afraid to challenge things, even like regulations, which indeed I think a lot of people would would say, hey, look, that's just the regulatory framework. It's a cost we have to bear. Um, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? So no harm in asking, and it looks like. And I think the regulators typically like feedback. Is that your experience, generally speaking, on these kind of things? Yeah, I, I think my experience with regulators has, has basically been in regulated utility space where you've got transmission and distribution businesses, um, and there isn't a competitive market necessarily. Uh, for some of those activities, so especially on the transmission side. And so a regulator has to set what they see as a competitive tariff. Well, what's a, In lieu of a market tariff, what do they think is, is an efficient market tariff? So, so my experience is that um, regulatory economists haven't had experience at actually running businesses, and they don't have experience at uh, transacting financial markets. And so there's a real opportunity to have a constructive um, conversation with these. I think they they certainly the regulated utility space, there's been a lot of argy bargy in Australia over that over that space. And 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 over the years, not so much now, but certainly over the years it's it's been it, it it's got pretty aggressive. But I think you can have a constructive discussion provided you you bring evidence to the table, right? If it's evidence-based and you're saying, well, you know, w- what you're proposing is that that we can go into the market and transact this way in this size, well, the answer is yes, we can, but it's going to push the market so substantially that um, we're not going to get price outcomes that that you're looking at a Bloomberg screen at, at Benny. If we were not a regulated entity, would we do this at all? And, and the answer is no. So, if the regulator wasn't here, you wouldn't do it. 
why would we do it just because the regulator is here? It doesn't make sense. And so sometimes you can have discussions with them um, and they can be, um, my experience has been pretty good actually. And I've, I've dealt with regulators for, for utilities in, in two different jurisdictions uh, on opposite sides of the country and, and they've been positive both times uh, because they've been receptive to, to hearing what's, what is it actually like at the coalface. If all you do is go there and complain, they're going to be as receptive as anybody else to listening to somebody who, who just complains. But if you go and say, well, look, we've got, a, we've got a problem here that we don't think we can execute this in the market because of these reasons, and we think you should look at it this way. Um, generally, they've been quite constructive and and open to, to doing it. I mean, in the end, they want to they want good outcomes too. The difference, I guess, is that they might come more from a consumer perspective. What is the consumer paying? And I've worked for businesses where it's been, what's the return that we can generate? And so there is a there's a bit of a tension there, but. Um, but I, I found it, it, it has been constructive and it's, again, it points to treasurers getting um, involved at the, the beginning of the value chain and, and not at the end. And so if, you, if you're there at the beginning and you're working with a regulatory team or you're wh- whatever else it may be, if you're there involved at the beginning, you have the opportunity to influence the outcome that comes. Like any other part of the business, you can succeed or fail. Um, and I certainly haven't got everything that I've wanted, but there's no point sort of wondering, right? You might as well ask the question. If it's no, it's no. Um, then you can move. No, that's that's the goal then. So it becomes such a strategic treasure, you influence regulation. That's, that's a good bar to set. That's a, that's a nice way to look at it. So, Kurt, you touched on uh, cash conversion cycles and you ran us through what that uh, what that is and why treasury departments need to focus on it. How does the cash conversion cycle relate to working capital management and how can you use that to to be optimized maybe you could relate also to how treasures can influence profit and invested capital to achieve that yeah so for me working cap working capital is is incredibly important for for businesses and where that really came home for me was in rapidly growing companies uh, rapidly growing companies especially had very very tight uh, working capital. The, the the good thing about working capital is that it is it's effectively an internally generated form of, of capital, right? So you, you you're essentially trying to use your payables to fund your receivables, and you've just got to be careful that you don't push that so far that you you end up with with problems with with suppliers. So so I think it's 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 about being clever there it's about recognizing that it's important you know we've spoken a lot about you know me in a way trying to to push people a bit more um to to be more ambitious to be more strategic this is one area where i would say treasurers should be very understanding of of their of their working capital to to know what their cash burn rates are to to understand um, what is behind their their working capital, and if you get to that sort of point, you, you'll find out. Um, you know, there, there's uh, you know one one or two. You might have one or two large customers that just don't pay on time, and, and so uh, you, you can pick up the phone and actually talk to the treasurer in, in those organisations and and just sort of say, well, you know, we're all trying to do the same sort of thing here. Happy to try and work with you as much as we can but we can't have we can't have you missing your payments which is a very superficial sort of way of looking at it that's giving you your cash conversion cycling in numbers but it's not telling you anything that's behind it you can then go down through and sort of work with teams and you know it won't necessarily be the treasurer but it's a good team it's a good exercise for your team to sort of say well okay i want you to go through and Talk to people about the customer to cash cycle, influencing that. You know, are we getting invoices out on time? So when we do the work, do we send the invoice out quickly, shortly thereafter, or is there a lag? Um, often there's a lag. 
um, well, that's just costing you from not getting money out of the door. Let's talk to people about preparing invoices as as they go, so that um, by the time they've they've actually wrapped up the, either the end of the month or the job or whatever it is, they've got a couple of hours work and they're ready to send it out. And the day counts start from from that point. You can talk to the to the purchase to pay process. The forecast to fulfil process, you know your logistics and your your product life cycles, and actually go and talk to teams and say, well, look, if we can if we can optimise these things, the company benefits. How easy or how hard or how difficult it is it to improve these things by a day, by two days, by three days, by a week? How can we get this this actually going? And it, it can be it can start off initially by I'm really interested in what you do and I don't know much about it. Can you can you tell me about it, you know, over a coffee or something like that? And then as you start speaking, people start to, most people are, a bit, are pretty passionate about what they do, so they'll give you a lot more detail than you really intended to receive. And then some of that you might be going, oh, well, actually, if we do it this way, we get to keep money in the company for an extra few days. That's that's a good thing, right? We need, then we borrow less and we incur less cost. And and it, it becomes this virtuous circle of, of benefit. And and if you if you can do it, then you do call outs. You know, you, you have, you know, the internal systems that that sort of say, well, you know, um, Joe Blow is doing a great job in 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 sales or whatever it might be. And and so you um, one of the things that we used to we used to have to do that every month. And so what I would do is get the team together with the you know, with a week to go and say, look, is there anybody here who's had good interaction with us that we can actually say, look, these people are helping us do do our work. Um, they're helping to keep money in the business for longer, reduce our interest costs, whatever it might be, and we'd call it out in the business and let people know. Mm-hmm. So I think it's 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 about things like that. It's, don't just skim along the surface of the business. You need to it, it, I think as you go further up the chain, you, you are more strategic by nature. That's that's the expectation. But you still need to make sure that your, your teams actually get out of their, get away from their desk and go through the business and actually speak to people. And, and one of the things that that, um, that I do is, you know, tell people, uh, you know, if it's on the corporate finance side of the business that I ran, you know, get your safety gear, your PPE and go out and, you know, kick the tires on this kit. Have you actually seen what's being bought? You know, there might be a $500 million program to buy a bunch of stuff. Have you actually gone down and looked at one and where they're going to store it before they install it? Is it safe and is it, you know, secure? So it's things like that. It's just, you know, get, making sure your teams, if, if you can't do it as a treasurer, it's making sure that your teams actually do get through into the weeds but the the overall the overall theme that binds it all is value add saying we want you to understand this and understand how the business functions and operates because all of these little value additions uh, expense saving things are, are all going to add up into a lot of value by by new wrap up question for everything we've talked Kurt came to mind um, we've talked through a lot of KPIs right we talked about cash conversion cycle optimization we talked about risk appetite improving your risk appetite ROIC return on invested capital etc we haven't even touched WAC like weighted average cost of capital or anything like this when you come into a company right or as a consultant you come into something and say hey uh, we need to find a way to make this treasure we need to find opportunities to think more strategically about this as a treasurer in this company is there one kpi specifically that's your favorite one maybe it's number of days not spent at desk and actually on the floor uh, or something like this is there a specific kpi that you come in and say okay this is going to this is typically the best opportunity for a treasury department to have very high leveraged impact on the business as a business leader yeah look uh, and you mentioned it, right? The weight average cost of capital. The reason for that, I think, is so we spent a lot of time on the re- return on invested capital side. 
um, the, the ROIC has to be above the WAC to add value. So that's where it's all connected. That's where it, that's where it goes back to board level, C-suite level. So it's all connected. Everybody understands. It's relatively simple. Okay, this is, this is where I fit in the company and what I'm, what I'm doing helps the company. So that brings everybody together under a, a common drive or a common thing. When you look at the cost of capital, Treasury should own that as, as far as I'm concerned. We, we're the interface with financial markets. We're the only ones who can actually value that in real time. Uh, we can see where our debt trades. We don't have debt out there in, in that way. You, you can see the yield curve. You know where the government curve is. You know where the swap curve is. So you, you can you can see where the markets are trading. You can see where investment grade credit's trading. And so that gives you an idea on and comparables as well, you know, comparable companies in the industry. So, so only treasurers have that. And so sometimes there's this, you know, is it a corporate finance activity or is it a, a corporate treasury activity? Uh, I, I solved that because I had both things reporting to me. So that was simple. When when you don't have that, I say treasurers should own it. Um, treasurers should understand at all times where the cost of capital actually is. And that's if you're, if you look at it as a company perspective, where it gets really interesting for me is when you start drilling down into business units. Because if you're drilling down into business units, the cost of capital that they have will be different. They each have different risk. They each different um, contribute to the PL in a different way. You know, some businesses will be much riskier than other businesses. And so you can't apply the same sort of cost of capital to it. So whether you whether you have a different cost of capital or the same cost of capital with hurdle rates that are different, it doesn't really matter. It's the same thing. But that is where you can really, it's a real game changer for the business. It's very hard though. So where it's a, where it's a game changer for the business is now you can set up, if you have differentiated costs of capital for business units, you can now set up a situation where you've got a competitive internal market for capital. So when business units are coming and asking for capital so that they can invest in the projects that they want to invest in, the, the question that's being asked is, well, what return are you going to generate? So there's your return on invested capital. What return are you going to generate from it? But the other is, what's the cost of capital for that business unit? And so... It can be a bit confronting at times as a treasurer to say, well, you know, business unit A, your cost of capital is going to be 8%. Business unit B, your cost of capital is 5%. And people would get you know, quite anxious about the difference and why is it different. And then that's where you can sort of come back and say, well, you know, your contribution to the P&L is much more volatile than their contribution to the P&L. Well, you're operating in an industry that's much riskier than um, than they are, and therefore the expectation is your return should be higher um, uh, in order to be allocatively efficient. And and so there can be a little bit of negotiation that has to occur to put it in place. But once you do, um, it becomes a really it, um, interesting process because this can internally competitive market for capital means that people that they're trying to bring the very best that they can they might bring 10 projects but they know they're only going to get three over the line because other people are bringing stuff that's attracting more capital than them and then so that that whilst you might have a little bit more negotiation to do at the beginning you have less to do at the end people understand okay well you know i i understand why um, why I'm not getting everything I've asked for is because somebody else has brought something that's better. But but I think for me, that's interesting. It's also very rewarding, but it is actually quite difficult. It can be difficult doing that. And that there are other there are other things that layer in nowadays as well. You know, carbon pricing. If, you, if you're going to be introducing um, carbon pricing into it, you know, if people have, have got green bonds or, or sustainability focus and and you've got 
some some projects which are greener and friendlier um, and other projects that are browner and, and not so good and so um, you know how do you do that do you do it with do you do it with a penalty or do you do it with a reward things like that so I think there's still um, there's still quite a bit of art in the science of doing this um, but it is something that I think treasurers should really own and by owning it it means that they automatically become directly involved in the allocation of, of capital. And, and that way, they're, they're really, uh, again, a big part of, of, of that value chain. 